it's preparing. I'm bidding everybody in now. I'm bidding everybody in now. Well, hello everyone. Uh, this is uh, Henry Silentman with the uh, Navajo Nation Economic Development with the Small Business Development Department. And um, <clears throat> Let's get started. I think we're pretty much ready to go. We have one more joining. Marky D. So thank you for everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is one of our small business development departments virtual trainings. Um, happy Wednesday to everyone. Today we have um, um, Dr. David Daryl Watkins. He's an educator and U.S. Navy combat veteran, and uh, he's here to present uh, on our Be Your Best Entrepreneur series. And uh, the topic of the presentation is uh, Everyone Needs a Coach. And um, just to let you all know, the series continues next month on the 9th of November with decision making in multiple contexts. And then the last installment is what makes a great entrepreneur. And that's going to be at our Navajo Business Opportunity Day, um, part of the um, agenda there. And that's on December 7th at three o'clock. And I'm going to be recording this video as well. So Dr. Daryl Watkins, um, he's an educator and U.S. combat veteran. He has a um, background in higher education, public transportation, information technology, management, and military aviation. He's the CEO and co-founder of LDRC. It's a le leadership development and coaching firm out of Orange County, California. And uh, he's an associate professor of leadership, and he teaches courses at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. He's, he's taught and given lectures in Mexico, Spain, India, Singapore, Japan, Trinidad, and Tobago. Uh, he's also the uh, uh, department chair, program chair within Embry-Riddle Embry Worldwide College of Business. And uh, he has also flown 18 uh, F8 FA 18 Hornets off the U.S. carrier MS USS Midway. Wow! During Operation Desert Storm, he's a graduate of the Naval Academy, and he has an MBA from University of California Irvine. And uh, he holds certification in coaching, career coaching, Clifton Strengths project management, organization development, print writing, among others. He's also a, um, uh, an examiner for Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award and the CAPE program, which is the California Award for Performance Excellence. And he likes, uh, he has a wife of 27 years, Dr. Nancy Watkins, and um, three children. And he, uh, he's a big Dodgers fan. And um, he likes Jeeps, dogs, and whiskey, and Sedona. Dr. Daryl Watkins, um, thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much, Henry. Let's see if I can uh, figure out how to share my slides here. And we'll uh, get this going, share sound. Great. All right, super. Uh, Henry, can you give me a... Let's see, I lost you, but can you just let me know that you actually do see I my see it, slides? Yes. Super, thanks. Well, uh, hello, everybody, and uh, and thanks for uh, 
choosing to be here. I very much appreciate the opportunity to do this uh, series of Be Your Best uh, training workshops with the uh, Navajo Nation. And uh, we're going to kick this one off with um, one of my passions, which is coaching. And uh, this, this particular uh, training is, is really um, uh, about uh, what, it, what it takes to, to really get the, the most out of uh, coaching and, and what, what exactly coaching is. So uh, I wanted to start, and um, I actually am hoping... Uh, that I'll be able to see the chat box because um, I, th I think we've got at least a couple of people on the line here, and I'm hoping that we can have somewhat of an interactive presentation um, so that, uh, well, mainly the few of you who are on the line aren't going to get to just sit back and uh, listen to me um, chat at you for an hour and a half. I, tend to be uh, very interactive and uh, ask some questions and, and sort of engage the people in the room, uh, mainly because I don't like to hear myself talk uh, for too long. It's, uh, I don't find myself very interesting. Um, so with, with that said, I would also appreciate if everyone would just take a moment to uh, type your name and um, kind of what you do, maybe where you're from, into the chat box. Um, that would kind of help me get a little bit of um, an understanding of uh, who you are, where you're from, and, and kind of what you do. I have um, done that. I've modeled it into the chat room. And um, if you could do something similar, I would appreciate it. Let's see, so. So Henry, if you can at least do that, uh, well, then I know at least somebody can hear me out there. All right, we got Henry. Anybody else out there that can uh, share yourself? All right, while we're, while we're waiting for that, um, what we have here is uh, an image uh, of a couple of people in a uh, rowing in a canoe. And um, what I was hoping that we could do is just have everybody kind of reflect on this image uh, and sort of use it as a metaphor for coaching. In other words, um, as, as you see these um, two people rowing in a canoe, um, you see that there's a little bit of fog. Uh, there's a sort of a mountain bluff in the background uh, with a couple of trees on it. And how might you look at this and, and kind of uh, think about coaching as it relates to what you're seeing in this um, image? Um, thanks, Florenda, for uh, typing in your, your name there. So, um, for those of you who do have access to the chat, if, if you wouldn't mind just sharing your thoughts on, on how you see this uh, image as a metaphor for coaching. Uh, so, for example, for myself, um, the fog sort of relates for me to the fog that sometimes um, what we call coaches or clients uh, are in as they enter a coaching conversation. Maybe they're not quite fully understanding uh, something about their environment and they're coming into a coaching relationship to help work things out. So that's an example. So if you could just take a moment to share in uh, the chat box uh, anything that pops to your mind. And I've got one more image after this uh, and hopefully um, 
put this button. We'll be able to look at that also. Yeah, hit enter. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. Okay, there's Delbert checking in. Great. From Farmington, New Mexico. Okay. So we've got um, at least three of us on the line who've been able to figure out the chat. And as maybe other people are in and out, they can also uh, start working on the chat. But for those three of you, if if you could um, maybe just type a word or two into the chat box about this image and what your thoughts are on that. All right, so it's best to be cognizant about weather forecasts before venturing into risky climatic conditions. Margie D, thank you. Only a couple of folks in the boat, not a lot of people, right? So uh, that's great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about both of those things. So yes, there are a couple of people in the boat, and, um, and that's very common with coaching. So quite often, coaching is a one-to-one -one relationship between two people, uh, the coach and the coachee, or the coach and the client, uh, or as Delbert says, a coach and a student. That's right. Um, and so another thing that I notice about that particular thing is, so you can't really see the uh, oar of the person in the back of the boat. And that's kind of true of coaching also. Um, the idea is that the client is steering the ship and the coach is there as, uh, as really uh, sort of a guide, not in the, in the sense of I'm telling you where to go, but in the sense of there to help. Um, so this idea about being cognizant of weather forecasts, that's an extremely important one, right? So we quite often embark on things in lives without really knowing where, um, where they're going to go or how they're going to turn out. And so uh, that's one of the main reasons that people come into coaching, because we're a little bit uh, unsure of what our environments are, uh, our environment is, and we're hoping that um, a coach can help us figure that out. And um, yeah, quite often um, a coach is involved in teamwork. All right, so I'm gonna move on to my second image. And uh, this second one is a little bit more direct. Um, and we're gonna use this same sort of format. Um, if you could just type into the box kind of what this image evokes um, about the coaching relationship. And I'll give a second for you to give me your thoughts on that. Hi, Genevieve from Big Horse. Oh, Genevieve, Big Horse is your name. I'm sorry. And where are you? Where are you um, calling from, Genevieve, or in from? Unwinding thoughts. That's right. So this, this one is pretty clear, unwinding thoughts. And this is a big one, um, at least with my coaching clients. Very often, uh, my clients will come in. Um, they have all the thoughts sort of tumbling around in their head. And they're just not really exactly sure what to do. And so even more than coaching, they're just looking to have somebody that they can talk to, that they can get all these thoughts out to. And in the process of getting them out and maybe some good questioning, they can organize their thoughts in a way that makes sense to them. Uh, Genevieve from Tuba City, thank you. All right, I'm gonna move on to um, the rest. So, uh, Henry, I really appreciate the introduction. I just dropped a couple of things here about my background into the slideshow, just to give you an idea of um, kind of where my passions lie. Um, I have been coaching for, I don't know, roughly 25 years, but it's not the only thing that I do. It is just um, something that is really important to me and sort of a way of life for me. 
uh, I say 25 years, that's a little bit after I left uh, the military uh, as a U.S. Navy pilot. Um, I went into some entrepreneurial um, ventures with high tech and uh, got out of those and, and got into project management, uh, IT project management mainly. And then I went to transportation and tolling and started working on my doctorate. And that's where I really fell in love with coaching as a thing. So I have a doctor of management in organizational leadership. Um, as Henry mentioned, I'm a Baldrige examiner. So I've uh, been privileged to be in some of the best organizations in our country to observe how they work uh, through both Baldrige and the California Council for Excellence. And um, you know, it's, it's truly been interesting to see well-functioning companies. Um, you know, other than the Navy, I haven't personally been privileged to work in a company that is perfectly well-functioning. And so to see other companies that are really operating at the, at the very top of their game is inspiring. And, and that's really why I coach, because I hope to bring out that sort of potential and, uh, and impact in everyone that I uh, come in contact with. So the, now that we're uh, quite a few minutes into this, uh, the objectives of this uh, session were to define and differentiate coaching, uh, to describe it a little bit, and then really to talk about um, self-awareness that we gain from coaching and give you some tools for coaching yourself and coaching others. Um, <clears throat> so with that said, um, there are some specific tools that we'll be talking about uh, that I use in my coaching, um, the ask, tell matrix. Uh, I'll give a definition of coaching. Uh, we use something called the Johari window, a balance wheel, uh, the ladder of inference, and then the grow model. Uh, we're going to touch um, on each of those. And I noticed that Henry just shared the presentation slides um, in his Dropbox. I appreciate that, Henry. So um, I'm going to set the stage here with this uh, very dramatic um, and possibly quite upsetting image uh, of wildfire. Um, you know, I, I live in Southern California and as a community, we are suffering from some very, very big problems. Uh, you know, many years of drought and wildfire that results, um, you know, the effects of climate change, um, political upheaval, you know, our governor was recently attempted to be recalled. Um, you know, we've had problems with energy crisis and things like that. So these are some of the big problems that um, we are facing. And so my question to you is if, if you'd be willing to put into the chat box, what are some of the big problems that your communities are facing? Uh, maybe, maybe they don't keep you up at night because they're even too big for you to deal with, but but there are certainly concerns that, that might cause you to, you know, have conversations around the water cooler or with your families or things like that. And um, by communities, I mean all of your communities. So whether we're talking the Navajo Nation or the work community that you're with, your families, um, however you want to put that. So uh, Delbert, rising COVID cases. Yeah, that has been a big problem. Um, you also asked if this information will be available. So the presentation slides are in Henry's Dropbox. He posted that message. Uh, and if you want more than that, you can contact me afterwards and I can actually send you the um, actual slideshow. Unemployment, thank you. Big problem. So, you know, if you if you watch the news, uh, you would think that there were jobs in abundance, but it seems like uh, many communities are suffering from unemployment. And I noticed that uh, 
I think one of our individuals here on this call is, is unemployed. Um, this is an extreme problem. Sometimes it relates to things that are um, within our control and sometimes things that are beyond our control, um, especially as it relates to, uh, you know, needing to retool your uh, bag of um, capabilities, for example. Um, you know, maybe you work in an industry that, you know, technology has taken out and now you need to go into a whole new area. I mean, these are major concerns. So um, appreciate uh, those who contributed to that. Uh, I want to kind of shatter this way of thinking and uh, talk a little bit instead about some of the more promising developments in your community. Um, what are you proud of that's happening in your life? What are you looking forward to? And I'll ask again that maybe you put something into the chat boxes. Um, you know, for myself, you know, I have uh, three young men, uh, 24, 22, and 20 years old who are just starting out their adventures in life. I'm incredibly proud of them. And I'm looking forward to seeing, um, you know, how they grow up and, and how they are going to be in this world. Uh, what are some of the things that, that you're looking forward to? I'll give a minute to uh, allow you to put some of those things into the chat box, if you would. New home, a new job. And I imagine that based on Delbert's um, previous message that we might be looking forward to COVID and this pandemic going away completely. I personally am looking forward to uh, the prospects of a massive infrastructure bill being passed and huge um, infusion of economic life into our infrastructure in this company. Having uh, worked in transportation and tolling, um, I can tell you that our roads are in massive need of improvement. <laughs> Retirement, a Walmart, okay, very good. So um, some of the things that you might look for from a Walmart would be possibly jobs um, coming into the community, um, access to lower cost goods and services, starting a new business, um, and pandemic is making that um, difficult. Yeah, understood. <laughs> More people getting vaccinated. I sure, sure echo that one. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and uh, move forward from this. And thank you for those contributions. And so, so why am I approaching this this way? So, uh, you know, my first question to you was, what are the problems? And then I asked you, what are some of the possibilities and opportunities and things like that? And so admittedly, I set you up a little bit, but I will say that generally speaking, most people tend to focus on what is difficult. They tend to focus on the problems. They tend to focus on um, the issues that we have um, in our lives. There is another side. And so I've said on the slide negative and positive, but it's not really that simple. It's really um, possibly a matter of focusing on what are our problems and what are our solutions. And so as I um, move on, there is a thing that I use in my coaching practice called the ask, tell matrix. And I use this to explain what are some of the helping relationships, right? And so, one of the things that I promise to do in this um, workshop is describe what some of these relationships are and how they're different or the same as coaching. So we can tend to focus on the problem or the solution as we've discussed. And we can also tend to focus on, in terms of helping ourselves or helping others, um, asking what, where we are or telling where we are. So we ask when we're curious and we tell when we believe that we have expertise. 
And so what we can do is we can sort of create this graph with ask and tell and problem and solution, and then call these quadrants. So quadrant one is asking about the problems. Quadrant two is telling about the problem. So here's a problem and I'm gonna tell you what the solution, what tell you um, once I understand what the problem is, how to get out of it. Quadrant three, you're really more focused on the solutions and um, sort of telling people how to get to those solutions. And quadrant four, um, using a process of asking to get towards the solutions. And so as we think about different helping relationships, right? So there's therapy and counseling, everybody's sort of familiar with what those are, but what uh, therapists and counselors tend to do is they focus on what are our issues and through a process of asking us about our lives and what happened in our past and things like that, they help us to uncover hopefully the things that are holding us back so that we can then uh, be prepared to move forward. Oops. So then um, in quadrant two, I've uh, put mentoring and consulting. So what do mentors and consultants do? They are sort of, for the most part, focused on, well, going into an organization or working with an individual and figuring out, well, sort of what is, what's wrong? What, the, what is the problem here? And now either based on my expertise or something that I have previously experienced myself as in the case of a mentor, here's how we're going to suggest that you move forward, right? So that's essentially what a mentor and a consultant do. Then we have teachers and advisors. So teachers and advisors are generally focused on um, where is it that we want to go? How do we want to move forward? What is it that we want to know? And they give us the answers. So, you know, for example, in my university, uh, we have a group of something like 30 advisors. They all understand our curriculum. They know who our professors are and all those sorts of things. And so if a student comes in and wants to know, well, what courses should I take to get a particular degree? Well, the advisor tells them, take this course. So focusing on solution and telling. And then that leaves us with the final one, um, asking and uh, solutions. So what do coaches do? What do we do when we are involved in empowering conversations? Um, and if you're familiar with one form of consulting called appreciative inquiry, um, we're focused on how do we move forward? And based on moving forward, uh, we, we are asking the client or the coachee uh, a deep set of questions that are focused on what will help that person move forward? So are there any questions about this before I move on? So what I will say is um, I, am, I am a teacher and a coach. <laughs> so if you have questions about anything as we're going through this, if something doesn't make sense, if I misspeak or, you know, just something just doesn't quite hit you right, please put it into the chat box. I am monitoring that as I go through this and more than happy to explain anything in more detail. Okay, so. So, um, um, Daryl. <clears throat> yes, please. Go ahead. So you're, you're, you're not trying to... Um find out the problem you're just trying to find solutions is that is that what a coach does so thank you for that question um what a coach is really trying to do is get you to a place where you are performing where you can perform often that will require covering what the problems are, but that's not where the focus is. So for example, if I am coaching somebody, if I'm working with a person 
And that person is talking to me about a lack of balance in her life. I need to understand generally where that person is coming from in terms of balance. But what I really want to be focused on as the coach is, okay, well, you've said that this is where you are in terms of your balance. Where do you want to be, right? So do you want to be balanced in this way or this other way, right? So it's, I don't wanna give the impression that in any of these relationships, you're not doing all of these things. Um, what I want to say is that it's just really a matter of where the primary focus is. Uh, does that help, Henry? Sure does, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Okay, so I am a certified coach with the International Coaching Federation, and that is kind of the main coaching uh, organization, association in the world. There are several, but that is kind of the one um, that is the de facto leader. They define coaching as partnering with clients in a thought-provoking and creative process that inspires them to maximize their personal and professional potential. Okay, so what's important about this definition? So partnership, coaching is a partnership between at least the coach and an individual or between the coach and a group of individuals. So you can coach a team, you can coach a company, you can coach an individual. Uh, thought provoking, it is inherently a thinking process, right? Because we're talking about what are the things inside of our brains that are keeping us from getting to and being who we want to be in this world. A creative process. So we think of coaching as co-creative. And what that means is that both the client and the coach are continuously dancing, if you will, in the conversation in a way that's creating meaning for the client. Uh, and inspiration, because coaching is a process that focuses on solutions instead of problems, and because it's focused on asking the client about their experiences and not the coach telling the client what to do, coaches are more committed to going where they're trying to go because all of the stuff is coming out of their brains. It's just being sort of helped, the, co the coach is just helping to shape the relationship. So how long um, does this all take? Well, it certainly does depend. Um, so I'm answering uh, Delbert's question right now. It depends on what the coaching is for. So um, I've coached a person on a, two hour airline flight in a 15 minute conversation. And I have coached um, people over a four or five year process. So, um, so what I would say is that in coaching, you hope to, co you hope to coach to a long-term vision and then you have uh, smaller term goals that are inside of that vision that you would coach to. And depending on what those goals are, um, it might take one hour session. It might take three hour sessions, a couple of weeks. Now, with that said, I personally like to set up at least three or six month contracts with people because that gives time for us to get to know each other and for the client to really kind of dig deeply into uh, the vision. So one of the things about coaching that is different from other helping relationships that we talked about on the previous slide is that clients are assumed to be creative, resourceful, and whole. And this is different from, for example, the therapy or counseling type relationship where you assume that there is some sort of underlying pathology that the therapist or the uh, counselor is trying to help solve, right? In this case, um, we believe that the client holds 
all of the keys to the kingdom, if you will. The coach is just there to help them figure out which key to use at this moment. Yes, whole means um, not crazy, for lack of a better way of putting it. Not missing, um, <laughs> not not missing a couple of screws. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, you know, yeah, so whole could mean a lot of things, but really it means that you are um, in a place where, where you can really accept um, the, the launching into a new place. Um, I have gone into some coaching relationships before and found that for whatever reason, um, these three assumptions are not met. And in that case, it's my professional duty to let the client know that this is not the best time for coaching, for example. Um, it might be better if they would see a qualified um, psychiatrist, for example, or maybe they're in such a deep depression or something like that, that they just cannot access um, any inkling of creativity um, to help themselves get out of it. And, and those are really tough places to be. Um, and it's the coaching relationship is, is not really intended for that sort of an intervention. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Okay. So I'm getting into that place where I feel like I'm talking more than I want to be talking. But So um, one of the nice things about coaching is that I only do about 5% of the talking instead of a training thing like this where I'm doing 95% of the talking. So with that said, um, I'm going to guess that you might recognize one face on this screen, um, the one in the middle, but let me just uh, give you the names of these people. Uh, the person on the upper left is uh, Martha Beck. On the upper right is Bill Campbell. Uh, that is Tony Robbins in the center. The person down in the lower left is Steve uh, Belichick, and the person on the far right is Tim Story. Now, these people are coaches. So now you get to find out who they are coaches to. So, Ooh. Martha Beck is Oprah's coach. Bill Campbell was Steve Jobs and Eric Schmidt's coach. Tony Robbins coached Mother Teresa amongst many, many other famous people. Um, Steve Belichick was, is Bill Belichick's father and his coach. And Tim Story is the coach to Tarek and Christina El Musa. And if you don't know who they are, well, you probably just are uh, too smart to watch a lot of bad TV. <laughs> so they have a, a show on uh, Bravo, I think, or maybe Home Garden or whatever. But anyway, so these are, um, you know, I, I think that the point that I'm trying to make here is that uh, even people who seem to be at the top of their games have benefited and relied on coaches. And what that should tell us all is that a coach can help make us not just better, but a coach can help us get to the very top. And, and don't we really all deserve to live the life that we hope to live, the life of vision that we want? So, um, my next slide is a clip from Oprah. And in checking this with Henry before the meeting, uh, the, vi the audio wasn't coming across very loud. So I'm gonna start it. And if it 
doesn't work, uh, just let me know. It's I think it's about two minutes long, uh, but I don't want to sit here for two minutes and have you watching Oprah and not be able to hear her. So in that case, uh, just put into the chat that you can't hear it and I'll stop it and move on. It's much bigger. The design, the, the, the reason why I'm here is much bigger than, oh, I think I want to see what's under there. So the ability to, 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 to take care of that, to honor that, to honor yourself and that which is greater than yourself, that which cre was the reason for your being here, that, 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 there's no selflessness in that because only through that do you have the ability to offer yourself, your whole self, your full expression of who you are to the rest of the world. So I remember the very first time I had a life coach, they weren't called that at the time, but an expert on, who shared with our audience, the women, she did a list and say, where are you on the list? And literally in that audience, women booed her when she said, put yourself top of the list. This was in 1992. In 1992, the idea of being top of the, your own list was people like, how dare she? And she doesn't have children. I said, she didn't say abandon your children and go running in the streets. <laughs> she just said, put yourself at the top of the list. Nurture yourself, honor yourself. Stop the crazy mind chatter in your head that tells you all the time that you're not good enough because that's the number one I found to issue with everybody. Uh, the reason people say, you know, how, how is that? How is that? It's because you, you, you want to know how do you measure up? Well, to know that you're just being here. You're just being here. However that sperm, bam, hit that egg. <laughs> However that occurred for you, that your being here is such a miraculous thing and that your real job is to honor that, is to honor that. And the sooner you figure that out, oh, wow, wow. I'm one of the lucky ones. I got to be here. So how do you continue to prepare yourself to, 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 to live out the highest, fullest, truest expression of yourself as a human being? And I just want to end with this. Yeah. There are no mistakes. There really aren't any, because you have a supreme destiny. When you're in your little mind, in your little personality mind, where you're not centered, where you really don't know who you are, that you come from something greater and bigger, and that we really all are the same, when you don't know that, you get all flustered. You get stressed all the time, wanting something to be what it isn't. There is a supreme moment of destiny calling on your life. Your job is to feel that, to hear that, to know that. And sometimes when you're not listening, you get taken off track. Okay. So... The reason that I wanted you to, uh, to see that video was not because I was anticipating uh, Delbert's commentary in the chat box, but I guess I was. Because, because really, um, we, when it comes to us being our best and when it comes to us achieving everything that we can, um, we are our we are our greatest cheerleader. We are our biggest, um, I don't wanna use the word enemy, but we are our biggest obstacle. And um, self-doubt and not believing that we're good enough um, get in the way of all of us. It's, there is nobody who is immune from that. But the people who are able to get through that and live, um, you know, a life of fulfillment um, are able to put those voices aside um, if, if long enough to, to get to where they're trying to get to. Okay, so um, I am going to move into some of the, uh, the tools that I use. Uh, the first one is called the Johari window, and uh, it's it's not complex, uh, but it, it's it's going to take me a little bit of time to build up to it. Um, this window was created back in 1955 by uh, two psychologists or psych psychologists named Joseph Luft 
and Harrington Ingram. So they took their names, Joseph and Harrington, and mashed them together to create this thing called the Johari window. This is an extremely powerful tool. So basically, what we're doing is we're looking at uh, the top as being self, what is known to ourself, and what is unknown to ourselves, and then the side as what is known to others and what is unknown to others. So the darker blue band is known to self, unknown to self, and then going across known to others and unknown to others. And so you'll notice that we love quadrants with coaching, although these quadrants are different. Uh, quadrant one is known to self and known to others. Quadrant two, unknown to self, but known to others. Quadrant three, unknown to others, but known to self. And then quadrant four, nobody knows. And so now we've given these quadrants names, open, blind, hidden, and unknown. So the open area, if you can imagine, is like, say you've just started a new job and you've met all your coworkers, perhaps you went out um, and you know, had a meal with them. And during the meal, you shared some things about yourself and they shared some things about themselves. So those things that you shared are now open to them. So imagine at that meal that um, one of your new coworkers kind of witnessed you, um, I don't know, having a nervous tick or something like that whenever somebody on your team said something. You didn't know that you had a nervous tick, but your coworker saw that. So that nervous tick is blind. It's in your blind spot. You don't know about it, but your coworker noticed it. Um, in the hidden quadrant, now imagine that you know, you're in this new environment. So of course, you're not going to share everything about yourself. You're not going to be completely transparent. So you hide some things. That's hidden. And then uh, quadrant four are those things that are um, unknown for everyone. So we use this in coaching as a tool. And so the first thing that we can understand is that as a person, you can interact with other people and ask them, hey, tell me something about myself that I don't know. Maybe you don't say it exactly like that, but you know, there are yeah. ways of asking about yourself, right? Uh, you know, maybe, maybe you are just having a heart to heart conversation with somebody and you say, you know, I, I would really like some feedback from you. I've been struggling in this particular area. How do you think I'm doing? And that person might share some thoughts with you on how you're doing that, that you weren't aware of. And so you can, you can kind of open up your open area and diminish your blind spot by seeking that sort of feedback. Um, you can also choose to tell some people more things. So in that conversation with your coworker, your coworker shares, you know, well, I noticed that you have seemed really sort of as if you're kind of pulling back from everybody. Um, you didn't know you were pulling back, but your coworkers noticed it. Well, now you say, you know what? Thank you for sharing that I was pulling back. Um, maybe a reason that I've been pulling back is because my father is sick and because he's sick, I'm really preoccupied with, with being at home and caring for him. And so now you're self-disclosing things, um, which is opening up your hidden area to, um, your colleagues. And so you're, again, you're opening your open area. Now, your coworkers can also continue to observe things about you, right? So um, they can notice, for example, that um, 
you know, oh, well, you know, he, he mentioned that his father is sick and, and he's been, um, you know, kind of pulling back. But I also noticed this other thing about him that his, you know, his work is, is really, has just really gone down the tubes or something like that. And you can discover more about yourself, right? So, you know, you read a book and you go, oh, hey, here's some new tools for how to deal with grief or anxiety or depression or how to go for a goal or something like that. These are things I didn't know before. So I'm starting to learn more about myself through this process. And so really the coaching process is designed to help you maximize your open and minimize uh, your other areas. Spent a lot of time building out these slides. I hope that uh, they are effective. <laughs> All right, so uh, just kind of a little bit more about ways that we might use the Johari window. So I am a Clifton Strengths uh, certified coach through Gallup. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Clifton Strengths, uh, it is an assessment that has been given to something like 30, or excuse me, 26 million people. Well, 26 million assessments. Some people have taken it more than once, but you get the idea. It's been given a lot. There is a lot of data behind it. Uh, the person who invented Clifton Strengths, Don Clifton, uh, was really interested in knowing what helped to make people successful in their jobs. And so he launched a study um, at the time he was the CEO of Gallup. Um, he launched this study where they uh, actually took in data from hundreds of companies and like I said, millions of people to understand what made people successful. They took all of those success factors and they lumped them into 34 talent groups, which we know as strengths. Um, if you take the assessment, you can understand what your strength profile is. And Clifton or Gallup rather has programs to help you understand uh, and learn about yourself how to lead teams, and how to manage organizations using these ideas. So with the Clifton Strengths, you can use um, the Johari window along with your strengths to understand, well, where is it that my behaviors are transparent and people understand that I'm bringing my strengths to bear? Um, and people understand that. So, you know, for example, one my top strength is uh, achiever. And that means that I work really, really hard to get things done that I commit to. Well, the people whom I work with typically understand that this is a strength of mine because as they give me work, I get it done. And they say, hey, boy, Daryl is really achievement oriented or driven or something like that. Now, misperceptions and misunderstandings, area lacking self-regulation. Well, one of the shadow sides, if you will, of my achiever strength is that sometimes I stay up way too late working on something. So um, that is an area where I lack self-regulation. I will give up my personal sleep to finish a presentation, for example, um, or to you know, finish work that I promised. And that affects my family because I'm not available for them you know, when they're enjoying family time. I'm still working. So that's, a, that's an area where I lack self-regulation. Now, I happen to be aware of that, but if I wasn't, uh, then this would, be, this would be something that would be a blind area, something that we could learn about using the Johari um, window. So Delbert um, offers that he's nice to a fault. Uh, and that's an interesting one because nice can be part of many different strengths Right, so nice can come from maybe you have a high amount of empathy and you use your empathy to be nice. Maybe you're a very positive person um, or things like that. And yes, there are shadow sides to all of those sorts of strengths. Um, and 
and they can tend to put us back, if you will. So back to the hidden um, side and unclaimed talents and underutilized talents. Well, there are some of my strengths, for example, that I don't fully lean into. Um, so for example, this is not a true example, but we'll just say that it is. Um, my fourth strength is called relater. And with the relater talent, what you do is you sort of lean into relationships. So um, when I meet people, if I don't lean into those relationships, um, then I'm not really using that talent. So either it's unclaimed or it's, it's underutilized because I'm not really kind of maximizing its use. And then finally, um, unknown potential. So, I mean, there are just simply things that we don't know about ourselves until we're tested. So, um, you know, when I was in the Navy flying off of carriers, I had to go through a process of training and training and training to get to a place where the Navy would trust me to fly an airplane that cost $30 million off of a carrier. Well, I had to learn about myself during that process. I had to unlock hidden potential that I didn't know that I had as a 21 year old. So that sort of thing is critical as you are, um, building yourself out and optimizing who you are. And uh, the whole idea is that this tool, the Johari window, um, can be used to help you understand this. And with a, you know, a coach, working with a coach or working with yourself, as long as you understand the tool <laughs> and what, you, what you're trying to do, um, you can figure these things out. But it's all about self-awareness because if you're if you're not aware of these things, then you know it doesn't help you. Okay, so I'm going to stop before I go on and just ask if there are any questions because I have been talking for a while. Okay, so no questions at the moment. So another tool that coaches often use is called a, a balance wheel. And, um, you know, I've seeded this balance wheel with some things, purpose, family, finances, work, spirituality, health, and friendships. Um, these are common things that a person might put into a balance wheel, but we can have whatever we want in our balance wheel. There are seven items here, but you could have eight, you could have 10, you could have two. That's, you know, it's really up to you and how you want your pie to work. The idea, though, is that you take a look at whatever things are important to you as an individual, and then you assign them a number. So I'm going to leave this pretty slide and go to kind of a more um, working person slide, if you will. So this is how I do this in Excel. I use a... Um, what's called a spider map. And I tie it to a little spreadsheet where um, I put in whatever the client's areas are. And then I ask the client to assign numbers to each of those areas that they have chosen. So for example, um, you know, a client might say, well, work, and by the way, I went to eight categories here instead of seven. Uh, work is an eight, because I really focus a lot on that. Family's a seven. I've got pretty good balance there, but you know, going down, it's, it's not so good. So if you can imagine putting that orange wheel onto your bicycle or car and trying to roll down the road, that would be pretty difficult, right? So the idea here is that the rounder your wheel, uh, the more balanced you are, no matter what the numbers are. Now, the idea here is, um, you know, what does it mean to be a 10? And what does it mean to be a zero? Well, a 10 means that you are where you want to be in that area. And a zero means that you couldn't be farther away from where you want to be in that area, right? So you are the one deciding what your level of balance is. It's not me, 
who's deciding? You are deciding. So if the numbers come out to look unbalanced, that's because that's your sense of your area of your way of balance, not your spouse's sense, not your partner's sense, not your um, coach's sense. Now, here's a, an example of a person who maybe has a perception that they're a little bit more balanced, but notice that there's still a gap. They're not at a 10 everywhere. And so any gap between the number that you're at and a 10 is an area of um, potential, a place where you might want to focus part of your um, process of improvement. Okay, so we're um, getting we're getting on towards the time when I want to start talking about what are some tools that you can take away from this session to either coach yourself or coach others, right? Because not everybody can have a coach, not everybody can afford a coach, and um, unfortunately, even though we all need a coach. We just can't all have one. So sometimes we have to coach ourselves or we have to coach each other in ways that, um, that can still be very meaningful. So the ladder of inference was developed by Chris Argyris, another psychologist, um, probably 30, 40 years ago now. Um, so the, at the bottom of this ladder, you have the pool of observable data. And that is everything right so all the, so right now i want you to imagine that we're talking about a specific situation so anything that relates to that situation is in the pool of observable data so then as you go up the ladder um, there are the observations that you can make from something and as you know um, when we see something we can't take in everything that we see. Our, our minds are not strong enough to see everything. Although we do know that our minds take in much more than we realize. So at any rate, so imagine that the observations that you make are sort of something like you might take from a snapshot with a camera. And then you select data out of those observations. Then you take meaning. I'm going to give an example afterwards. So let me finish going up the ladder and I'll give an example that will bring this all to life. Uh, you make meanings out of it. You make assumptions based on those meanings. And then you draw inferences. In other words, you have judgments and conclusions that are based on your assumptions. From this, you form beliefs that lead to actions. Now, this is a required part of life. We have to make inferences we couldn't, we couldn't go through a day without making inferences because we simply don't have the ability to inspect every single piece of data and run it through some sort of um, artificial intelligence that would allow us to compute what the optimal thing is to do in every situation. So we have to infer things. The problem becomes when our inferences are based off of faulty assumptions, poor meanings, and the wrong selected data. So um, as an example of this, so think about some of the pet peeves that you might have. Um, I live in Southern California and there are a lot, yeah, yes, Henry, inference like Sherlock Holmes. Um, there are a lot of people who engage in road rage, if you will. So I just jumped all the way up um, and made some conclusions, by the way. So the pool of observable data, I'm driving down the road. Everything that's happening on the road is happening right now. But what do I observe? I observe that somebody swerved in front of me and waved at me. So from that, I select a piece of data. He swerved in front of me. And maybe I interpret um, his wave as 
not a wave. So I make some meaning out of that. I make meaning that he cut me off. What am I assuming? Well, I'm assuming that he saw me there and that when he swerved in front of me, he did it on purpose. That's what I conclude. He acted intentionally. So based on this, I developed the belief that people are rude. And so then I act by driving more aggressively. Perhaps I give some nice waves back when people swerve in front of me that don't look exactly like the wave that they might have given me. So what's the point of all this? The point is that I made some conclusions based on what happened that may not be valid. So maybe he didn't cut me off in the way that I'm thinking he cut me off. Maybe there was a tire in the road and he was swerving to get out of the way of the tire. Maybe somebody from the lane over next to him um, swerved at him and he had to avoid an accident. Maybe there's a bee in his car and it bit him and caused him to swerve over. It could be a million different things that are different from the way that I looked at that situation. The point is that I didn't give any benefit of the doubt to that person. So how can I change my behavior? I have to go back down the ladder all the way to the bottom and try and change the way that I am looking at this. So maybe I need to select different data from my observations. Maybe I need to um, just give the benefit of the doubt and not allow myself to get amped up. Maybe I just stop the ladder at some point and, and say, well, he acted intentionally, but I don't have to believe that people are rude from that. I can just let it go. And so then I don't get to that place of action where I'm driving more aggressively. Now, I want to point out the reflexive loop. And that is that as we go up this ladder of inference, as we begin to believe things that are based on faulty assumptions, that feeds back into what we're observing and what we're selecting and how we act feeds back into what we're observing and what we're selecting. And so we get this reflective loop that is really like a vicious cycle. And that vicious cycle can lead us down a very bad path where we just get into the car and our blood pressure skyrockets because we're ready for the battle. And that's how many people get onto the roads every morning, just ready for that. And it just uh, takes the smallest little thing to flip the switch on them to make them into that aggressive driver that nobody wants to be around. Um, and how do you not misread? Uh, Delbert, did I explain how do you not misread or do you want me to go into more detail there? So, so I think that there are multiple places to this. So number one is being aware of what data is out there. So um, we'll just stay with this example, I think, because it's, it's probably the easiest thing. So number one is just being aware that there are more options than uh, the ones that we have sort of programmed into our mind, right? So it could very well be that that person cut you off and it could very well be that that person cut you off intentionally and it could very well be that that person cut you off intentionally and aggressively. But there are more options, right? The point of this is not that the person didn't cut you off. The point is that if you jump to a conclusion as to why that person did it based on certain assumptions, and those assumptions are not based on facts, then we have to recognize them as such. So in the case of, you know, this aggressive driving uh, example that I'm giving, 
it is not in your best interest or in the best interest of society to become an aggressive driver because other people are aggressive drivers, right? So we want to get to a place where we are in control of our reactions. And being in control of our reactions means that we understand what we're basing our behavior on. And so if that means, okay, I'm getting to this place, I got cut off, I could have gotten cut off for many reasons, and I'm not just gonna guess that I'm, get, that I'm getting cut off because this person is a bad driver or because this person is rude or because this person is um, whatever. It could be many different reasons. I'm just going to, instead of reacting to that, I am going to choose my reaction and my reaction is going to be to slow down, allow that person in, and just separate myself from that situation. So that is a more, um, it's a more productive behavior that you have consciously chosen rather than to allow your emotions to get hijacked by your assumptions. Now, this thing that I've talked about in terms of driving is something that triggers people almost immediately. So you really have to train yourself against making those um, inferences in the way that we do. In the workplace, it's typically a little bit different. We don't typically jump to conclusions as fast. We typically don't get triggered as fast, but you can. I think most of us have worked with a person who walks into the room and we end up rolling our eyes because we dislike that person so much. Um, this would be the kind of tool that you could use your, for yourself or that you could use with a coach to go back in time and examine why it is that you have gotten to a place where this person is triggering you so that you can then develop a different habit when that person enters a room. Um, and that requires, yeah, well, you don't know what that person is going through, but going back to the Johari window that we talked about earlier, one of the things that you can do is you can go back and instead of just making assumptions or choosing not to make assumptions, you can ask, you can say, Hey, um, Henry, what's going on? I, I noticed that you've been acting, or my belief is that you've been acting in such and such a way. Is that incorrect? Or, or, or here's the behavior that I've observed. Can you help me make meaning out of this? So that way you're entering into a, um, a shared pool of observable data. And so that as you both go up your own separate ladders, that you get to a place where um, your beliefs are more similar because they are based on the same data. And, um, you know, I, I think that if we look to some of the national examples of like um, politics and COVID and things like that, that we can understand where some of these um, inferences that people are making are becoming very damaging to society in general um, because we're all operating from such different places in terms of um, the observations that we're making, the data that we're selecting, um, and how we're making meaning of it. Because very often, we're choosing to do that based on, um, you know, politics um, or something of that nature. So, Dr. Dave, Dr. Darrell, um how do you um, coaches intervene in in this process and and do they help us do that reflex reflexive loop and and talk yeah. about the observe select make meaning and do they take it apart and that's exactly what you do as a coach um, you help people to kind of dissect this and this is what you can do yourself right so you could sit down with this um, ladder of inference, and you could think through this on your own. All the coach is going to do is help you think through that and hold you accountable to that thinking. So sometimes um, 
we're not willing personally to dig into some of our thinking because um, of whatever reason. So as an example, some of our thinking is very deep rooted in our culture, in our beliefs. Um, and digging into that can be very harmful to our psyche. And so what the coach can do with permission is to help you dig into those areas that you haven't been willing to explore before. Okay, so I have just one more area in which I want to leave a little bit of time here at the end. So um, let me go to this last piece. And this is a, um, a coaching model that is very widely used in executive coaching. Um, this is not what I personally use, but I'm introducing it here because I think it's something that's super easy for almost anybody to use as long as you put yourself into a curious mode as a coach versus as a expert telling mode. So this is called the GROW model, Goal, Reality, Options, and Way Forward. And um, here are some questions that you could use to ask of a person. So for instance, if, um, you know, Henry, if you and somebody in your office wanted to coach each other, uh, you could just sit down and, and you could walk through some of these questions. You could go onto the internet and you could Google grow model and um, you could find, um, you know, hundreds of questions for different areas maybe not hundreds for goal or hundreds for reality, but hundreds total um, of questions that you could ask. So, you know, so why hire a professional coach? Well, because a professional coach is trained in what sort of coach, uh, what sort of questions to be asking might have a slightly different model that they're using and, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, if, if I were to, to really try and hone in on what it is that I think makes me an effective and a good coach. Um, it's that I am uh, interested in listening to people. Um, I am, so my superpower is my listening. I allow people to really get into the heart of what it is that they're trying to tell me without interrupting them, unless I'm interrupting them um, with a really good question that can help them refocus on where they're trying to go instead of focusing in on that, um, that past and the problem. So I think I have some takeaways here. Um, so yeah, everyone needs a coach. And um, I think that if as a coach, you remain focused on curiosity and, and being in that uh, solution focused place that you can be successful as a coach. And um, what we're really talking about here is helping a person get towards their vision, aligning their life with their values. Um, and it's really also about action. You know, coaching is not designed just to um, create a plan. It's to help a person create a plan. What are the actions to make that plan come true? and then helping hold yourself accountable to get there. So um, I, think, I think that's it. So um, Henry, I am going to pass it back to you and uh, open it up for questions or allow you to manage the rest of the meeting however you choose to. Well, Dr. Dr. Watkins, that, that's great information. Thank you. So I just put my um, grow coaching question in the um, chat. I guess that's one of the questions we want to ask uh, each other, I guess. <clears throat> but um, thank you so much for sharing. And uh, are there any questions for Dr. Watkins? That was a lot of information. So I can imagine it's going to take a little bit of time to <laughs> digest some of that. Let me so share can my you screen. Hear, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. Um, my, my thing was, uh, I wanted to start a business, but, um, you know, in transportation, um, as, a um, a bus transit is what I want to start, but with the pandemic, um, I'm not sure if I should bring like, uh, my customers off the reservation onto the Navajo reservation. So I, you know, it's kind of, I don't know if I should do it or not because I'm afraid if I bring somebody that has COVID onto the reservation, I don't want to feel guilty about it. So I'm kind of holding off on it until it all settles. So, um, it's kind of don't know how to get over that. <laughs> yeah. So what's your gut telling you on that one? Uh, it's telling me to wait until, you know, um, there's like probably like a, complete solution to how this COVID is going to uh, play out as far as, you know, if there's going to be like a real um, medical breakthrough, they'll kind of put a halt to it or slow it down or to where everyone is comfortable to where you can travel without having to worry about there's still cases out there or not. So that's kind of where I'm at, where um, this is something I've, I've been wanting to do for a long time. And I got my CDL and my passenger's endorsement to start the business, but I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to bring anybody off the reservation onto the reservation that has COVID because it would yeah. make me guilty. I'd feel guilty about that. I would feel guilty. Loosely. Yeah. If we were, Delbert, if we were coaching, I would, um, I would start asking you about what are some other options because, you know, you had a very strong gut reaction about you know keeping the people around you safe and and there's probably something really important there and so then the next level of questioning would be well where could you take this that doesn't put the people that you love in jeopardy yeah i've never thought of that um that's something i would have to I've never thought of it that way, but I would have to think of it and try to find a solution going in that direction instead of the, I've only got like one vision, one like a tunnel vision of where I want to get with this bus company, but I haven't really thought of any, any other alternative. Um, I've had some friends say maybe, you know, do like Uber type of deal or, um, you know, medical transport, but there's, out on the reservation, there's multiple medical transports. The only problem with that is um, they have, there's like, um, they have a lot of medical transport businesses, but normally it's only one or two person that's in that vehicle <coughs> when it's our back. <coughs> with the company, there would be multiple, you know, passengers or, oh, yeah. So uh, thank you for that. And I don't want to, um, you know, go into any kind of deep coaching or something like that right now, but, uh, you know, a coaching demonstration is something we would often do on a call like this. Um, the, the place that I would uh, take you is to, to really crystallizing your vision for what you want this business to be. Um, because your, your clarity around your, some of your values are, is very strong and that's good. So get clear on what your vision is for the business so you know where you want to take it uh, because that might give you answers as to, to where other uh, potential avenues could be. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that, Delbert. It sounds like we, we have the, um, the solutions inside of us and you know, we're resourceful enough to, to get to the point where we want to be. Is that, is that what I think you're saying? It absolutely is, right? So, I mean, I, I could have said, well, you know, hey, Delbert, you know, why don't you try this? Uh, I know somebody else who did this and it was very successful for them. Why don't you try medical transport? Why don't you try Uber, right? So that's focusing on the telling, which would be kind of the mentoring and the, you know, advising, right? But as a coach, you're focused in that in that asking solution because yeah delbert you know exactly where you need to go you just gotta pull it out of yourself easier said than done <laughs> yes yeah so um you know th this is um some of the um uh the outline that um 
uh, Daryl, you sent to me uh, regarding some of the essential questions and what is the coach and how is a coach different from other helping relationships? We talked <laughs> about ther therapy and different um, teaching and, and such. Um, and then what are the conditions for creating positive change? So I think, um, you know, resourceful and you know, not being crazy was one of those things too. Um, the learning objectives for today was, uh, you know, define different types of coaching, differentiate coaching from other relationships and describe how coaching can be used to unleash performance to help individuals overcome barriers, achieve goals and create a powerful vision for the future their future. So some of the takeaways today is um, everyone has unused capacity they can unleash and feedback is a gift and coaching is a high performance tool. But again, thank you, uh, Dr. Watkins. Um, there was a lot of great information and uh, today was uh, everyone needs a coach and be sure to uh, Join us the next time for decision making in multiple contexts. Dr. Darrell will be back and uh, on the, the 9th of November, uh, same time. And uh, and then um, we're going to be talking about what makes a great entrepreneur in December with the uh, at the Business Opportunity Day. So Business Opportunity Day is um, is. Uh, this year's uh, recovery and revitalization after COVID. It's, uh, and uh, it's gonna be on December 7th from 8.30 to 4.30. And just, um, I'll be sending out the information about uh, registration and the business match making event um, with the uh, National Center uh, PTAC. So again, thank you um, again to uh, Dr. Watkins and uh, if you have any questions, uh, here's our phone number, contact information. And then you can also reach out to some of the uh, other regional business development offices. There's several on the call today. And uh, uh, be sure to, uh, this um, presentation is going to be on our YouTube channel. So be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll put the, uh, the information in the chat. But thank you all for coming, and y'all have a great week. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Darrell. Y'all have a good day. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Watkins.